houses. I saw this thing recently where they said, uh, um, let's divide a country into two. Let's make one a, one a communist country and one a capitalist country and wait 70 years and see what happens. And it was North and South Korea. <laughs> and the difference of how those uh, countries came out, I thought it was a really funny comparison. Um, I think no. also like capitalism is like so deeply embedded into the U.S. like way of life where just like the whole like manifest destiny and how that's evolved over generations, it's become a beacon across the entire world that everybody goes to America to quote unquote make it. And if you have all of those like-minded people who share that same vision gathering in the same place, well, no shit, it's going to become the, the beacon of all of innovation in the world. Right. Um, and, and, and the government and everybody from businesses to merchants to, um, you know, public, like everybody bands together behind that capitalist ideal. They don't stifle it. Like here in Canada, they stifle it. They monopolize, um, you know, in a lot of the rest of the world, they stifle that innovation, that growth. Whereas in America, it's like, it's pure competition. It's pure meritocracy. And if you can do it, do it. Everybody celebrates it as opposed to tries to shoot it down. Okay, Chris, your thoughts on uh, Chris? Chris, uh, first of all, thank you as well for your service. Chris is a veteran for those that don't know. So very special. Happy July 4th to you. Uh, any reasons for why, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, they all started in America? Any unique reason you think that happens? Um, so I think it's a combination of two things. Like we are essentially because we're a nation of immigrants, we're Immigration itself is like the biggest risk that you can actually take. Think about it this way. Like, I mean, think of your dad. I can think of my dad. You know, we come from a different area of the world. We speak a different language. We have different cuisine. We come from different ethnicity. But at some point we left and they came here, right? Which other country in this world could you just randomly pick up everything and move to and somehow make it and in one generation go from literally like nothing to millionaire status. Like I know plenty of people who are first generation like immigrants that are millionaires, right? So this country really is still the land of opportunity. I know a lot of people think that it isn't, but I, I believe that if you are willing to work, this country is willing to provide you that opportunity to get further, right? Um, that goes hand in hand with the ability to fail. We don't stigmatize failure as part of our culture. Like we will do everything we can to succeed, but we also don't stigmatize failure like other countries. Like in Asian countries, if you look at some of them, you know, like failure is so stigmatized that they don't want to accept that, you know what, it's going to take some broken eggs to make that omelet. And because of that, a lot of times people won't take that additional risk and people won't risk capital to do it either. They'll say, you know what, I could put my money on this startup with this kid at 25 telling me about how he's going to disrupt fucking YouTube, you know, and people would be like, no, I don't want to do that. But in America, th there's thousands of people that signed up and, and you know, hooked you up. I mean, give you the opportunity to succeed. And that's that's the key to America, right, where we all like band together behind this ideal of app, uh, um, capitalism, but we're also risk takers. So think of it, think of America as like the land of risk takers where we celebrate risk taking. Um, sometimes that actually is somewhat detrimental as well. But if you don't put in the effort, you'll never see where you end up going. Right. So if you look at like most of the founders of Google and like Google, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, I think Sergey was a first generation immigrant from Ukraine or Russia, you know, formerly of the Soviet Union. You look at uh, Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos was, I think, adopted by parents from, um, from I think he was actually Lebanese or something like that. Steve Jobs, same thing. A lot of times there's a certain grit that comes with being a first generation immigrant that's just on another level. And then every so often, every, every generation, you know, pays its dues and pushes their kids forward and ends up becoming like this never ending cycle of innovation. You know, I sort of want to pick up on that because like 
there's there's immigration all across the world. Like I'm I'm a first gen immigrant. Like I was born in Eastern Europe and I, I came here, you know, when I was young. I, I lived there half my life. My parents, you know, didn't have anything when they came here. And at some point now, I've become thinking way more seriously about moving to the States. Um, you know, I talked to talk to Tanner a little bit about this. Uh, I've talked to my friends about this. And it's interesting that you mentioned it, Chris, because a lot of these executives, a lot of the people in the tech space, a lot of these people who quote unquote make it, they're all like immigrants, essentially. And a lot of them are first gen immigrants. And so it's it's less so about the 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 fact that America sort of accepts immigrants how they are, but more so that it is known as like a gathering spot for in immigrants who are a part of that like hustle slash grind culture. Because for me, like I've reached a certain pace of work here at a relatively young age that I feel that I am disp disproportionately rewarded for my effort in Canada, number one. And then number two, I feel as though if I want to sort of go on to that next level, I have to do it in the States because if I work in the tech space here, what companies am I actually going to work for in Canada? Like Shopify is really the only option, which five years ago didn't really even exist as an option because everything is so monopolized. And so if I really want to be the best, the best at what I do, and I really want to just put myself to the test, can I do it? America is really seen as the big leagues because it gathers people from all over the world, right? And so that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a virtuous cycle of the larger that that community grows, the larger it's going to keep growing because it's now world renowned for that. It has that in its reputation. Yeah, I think you can just look to, you know, Chris's point about venture capital, like the most amount of investment dollars are spent in the United States, probably outside of China billions of dollars on these crazy ideas. And for every thousand that fail, you get the Instagram, you get the Facebook, you get the Palantir that's in, you know, from the government that invests in it. And like, you get some innovative companies. So I guess here's the new question. Do you think the American dream is still alive and people can take an idea, whether it's a, a, a liquor store or a billion dollar potential startup and actually achieve it in America? Absolutely. I think that's still, I mean, dude, I see immigrants still coming to this country mm -hmm and starting businesses doing what they have to to get in i mean certain communities they they help each other um and that's the that, that's the thing about like d depending on which community you come from your community tends to have like an inroad into a certain sector and then they kind of just like show you the ropes and then you go to the next level you know and and it's just it's just one of those things that like if you really are willing to work your butt off you can do it. Like I go to this um, Mexican um, hole in the wall restaurant in Brooklyn. Okay. Wait, 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 this hold lady, on. Like, like, a, like a glory yeah. hole? No, no, not like a glory hole. Jeez, man. And <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> whatever. Mexican glory hole. <laughs> so this, um, this Mexican restaurant and the lady there, it's, it's just a Mexican themed restaurant. I remember when I first moved to the neighborhood, she had just started like releasing the space, whatever, you know, it wasn't exactly like up there. It was kind of still very like, it's like dingy, but it was really, really good food, authentic Oaxaca Mexican food. And you could find it in the middle of Brooklyn. I went there, dude, I went there like last week, um, two weeks ago. I remember when I was, uh, when I was in New York and she had the place done up like amazing. She had like cleaned up everything. She put a bar in the place. Like there was like, um, um, what do you call it? Like soccer games on the side and everything. And she was just literally an entrepreneur, right? She spoke much better English now than she did when she first moved in. When she first moved in, she, I, I would have to like, like show her on like the menu. Like this is what I wanted, right? And she would just be like, okay, yes. But basic, very basic, very basic. No like super... English. And this time it was like, Hey, you know, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. Like, sure. I'll get you this. And they have this one green sauce, bro. I swear to God, next time you're in Brooklyn, we, we I'm going to take you, but it's, um, but it's awesome. And the thing is like, that is the thing about America. Like if you are willing to come here, put in the time, put in the effort and really like dig deep, you can build yourself up. She's built herself a successful restaurant. And she was telling me that she's actually looking to expand and buy another place in Queens, right? And then uh, and um, redo it using the same things that she learned here. 
I'm sure that her kid, I remember her kid used to actually sit at the restaurant in the afternoon reading. Her kid is in Colombia right now. You know, imagine, imagine that like you go from one side where, where someone just came here, started a business and now their kid is probably going to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, or something else like super, super up there, you know, and this is, this is what America is all about. Like even me, like my dad, when he first came here, he worked at 7-Eleven. I know that that sounds like pretty stereotypical, but there's a lot of immigrant groups that when they first get here, that's that's their only avenue of getting into, into employment, which is working in a convenience store, working in a fast food um, uh, environment. And my dad was actually, he had a master's in chemistry in India. But one of the things is at the time, it was tough, tough pickings for jobs. Um, he knew English cause he was really good with it, but he wasn't like enough to the point. He didn't have enough connections. Once he had enough connections, he ended up working at a pharmaceutical company, right. As a chief scientist there. And then I ended up following in his footsteps. So it just goes to show you that like, there's a lot of smart people that come to this country and sometimes things don't work out hundred percent the way that they would want. Um, but this country will keep giving you efforts if you're willing to put in and, and, and move to the next, next, uh, move to the next level. And then who knows one day you might, you might end up being someone big and it's all thanks to how the system is set up here. I think that, you know, whenever people hear that me and Tevis are Canadian, that they think that we want to be here, <laughs> you know, like I would much rather be in the States. Uh, Why? Why is that? Well, I mean, it's, it's better for the consumer. It, it, it's a bunch of monopolies and duopolies up here that are like, it's, it's capitalistic and uh, to a point where it's, it's um, anti-competitive, <laughs> you know, yeah, like there, there, there's a word for that. It's socialistic. It's not capitalistic. Sure. Like you have just enough choice where you have this illusion of choice. You have like two major news companies, two major telecoms, like two major um, Re really phone companies, big banks and, yeah, four and or five big banks. But why is that not the same in America? There's only J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. Yeah, so, no, 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 but we have thousands. thousand others. Yeah, so yeah. I just Googled it. The amount of Schedule 1 banks that we have is 80. You guys have like I think five thousand, four thousand or five thousand, yeah. Yeah, and then in terms of total financial institutions, you guys have like ten thousand plus. Wow, um, it's it's incredible. But then that leads to a bunch of companies like SoFi, for example, that offer better rates that can't or th that 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 want to beat out uh, other competition. Venmo, Cash App, all these companies that don't want to come to Canada because they know that the regulations are way too tight here. It's it's extremely anti-competitive and a bunch of companies do not want to come uh, north just because they don't want to have to deal with it. And not to mention that uh, the U.S. has like a 10 times bigger market potential in, in terms of like if you're selling anything or even if you have this career and you want to make jumps in the career, like in, in the nine to five rat race, like there's just a way bigger population. You have way more opportunities, whether it is networking or clients or, or whatnot. Right. So. You have a, a jurisdiction that has fewer taxes and plus you can even select between like 50 states is a lot of selection for you as opposed to, you know, what, like two provinces realistically or three yeah. provinces. So, Let, let's make 13 a stretch. provinces and two of them are inhabitable. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot to love. It's, but I uh, guess I go ahead, Tanner. Go ahead. No, I was, I was just going to say it's uh, it's extremely that is the land of the free, home of the brave. I mean, I'm I'm extremely jealous and, and you know love everything about America. Like it's it's incredible the infrastructure that you guys have and and um, the benefits that you get from it. I I was once starting an e-commerce company and was starting with a friend of mine and I was going to go send him a package. He lived uh, like you know a couple blocks away from me and it was fifteen dollars. I remember very specifically. I told Tevis the story. It was fifteen dollars to send him a package, a sweater from my house to his. But it was eleven dollars to send him a package from my house to California, so from <laughs> Ontario to California, it's it's halfway across the world, <laughs> and yet you know to go down this street was much more expensive. This is the type of of infrastructure that we have. It's terrible. Yeah, you know it's incredibly Planes interesting. Are no different. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was I was gonna say my dad is is a little bit similar to Chris. I mean, he had a liquor store for a while and then ended up buying a rental property and. 
you know, I really came to America with same thing. With my mom, she, my mom graduated like the Harvard of India. And when she came to America, she had to work at Walgreens because they were like, we don't give a fuck about that degree. And she had to like redo her education and all that stuff. So, so I guess, I guess the question is this now, I want everyone to give one answer that, that's hopefully a little different from the other. Why do you think America has the intensive, the incentives and the structures to promote all of this good stuff? Like why isn't Canada doing it? Why isn't France doing it? Why isn't Israel? And by the way, Israel is doing a great job, but why is Israel as big as well? Like why aren't people migrating from, you could call them third world nations and saying, I want to go to Israel. I want to go to Canada. Why are they saying, I want to go to America in particular to actually think they have this perception of, you know, becoming rich and living the dream. So well, first, I, go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say, well, first of all, I think a lot more countries are opening themselves up to certain levels of immigration. Like Can Canada, for the most part, has been a lot more welcoming to immigrant groups than um, than other countries have, like in comparison. I mean, they're still not like the United States, you know, where we are literally like, hey, come on in um, to a certain degree, especially if you are um, educated and you have like a professional you really need. Canada is actually pretty welcoming to to people, right? So if there was a number two country that I could choose to go to compared to the U.S., it would definitely be Canada. And number three would probably be Great Britain. Number four would be probably New Zealand and Australia. And then after that, I don't know. I don't know which other country I could probably like really fit myself into. So I think to a degree, people are willing, especially if you are high-skilled labor, there are definitely countries out there that are like, Hey, come, come here. Like you can, you can literally come here, work here. The difference though, is that you will never truly feel like you're part of the culture that you do in America. Like we, I, I when I see people, I don't see like, Oh, that guy's a white American. That guy's an Indian American. That guy's a black American. Like this, even though that's what a lot of times the media, and that's what I hate about the media that they try to portray America as this, like hegemonous like population like no dude we all are american like when we go internationally people still say like oh look at these goddamn fucking fat americans <laughs> over here right regardless whether you're black white chinese whatever like when you're an american people recognize you as an american you know and um huh no, i didn't what? say anything that's oh that's weird. so weird i got i just got an echo popping but um but overall I think we are really the melting pot of the world now. Um, but I do think that other countries are opening themselves up to like foreign immigration. The only thing that I, I honestly, this is the one thing that I, I would say that is a negative to me is that you cannot have unlimited mass migration into the country for one reason and one reason alone. There are a lot of countries out there that have stupid ideas. They have bad ideas. They have really destructive ideas and if you let one of those immigrant groups get in fully into the country and then end up becoming a voting block that can honestly change the fabric of this country they could th theoretically destroy what makes us great in the first place right so i'll give you an example of something that i personally like there are people in the middle east that believe that gay people should not exist and we should throw them off buildings yeah. right yeah. I'm sure majority of the people don't necessarily believe that, but if you let in a lot of people with that same belief all at one time, and now all of a sudden you're like, you know what? Maybe we should be start. Maybe we should start persecuting gay people. That is not what we do in America. And the thing is, though, if you let in a certain amount of people of that background over time, their views evolve. They grow. You know, they become a little bit better, and they understand that. Hey, you know what? Maybe the way that we were doing things are freaking backward. Like even, even when it comes to like Indian people, like we had a caste system for the longest time. I think the caste system's fucking bullshit. I yeah. think it's the worst thing that's ever been created. So if you let a whole bunch of Indian people in, they're still going to subdivide themselves into their caste. And now it's okay. It's just a practice that you, you just have to accept. And it's like, no, like yeah, we need to evolve past that. Yeah. It, yeah, it's just the acclimation into the culture through osmosis, right? Like you see mm -hmm. how other people do it. And let's say I'm a massive bigot. If I sort of go out on the street and, and share those ideas, I'm going to, those ideas are going to get shot down real quick. I'm going to say, oh, wait, like other people don't think the way I do or the way, you know, I, from the country that I came from, so on and so forth. And over time, 
you sort of become more educated on on how that society thinks. But it's also destabilizing from more than just the like let's say political climate or voting blocks. It's also destabilizing from like a socioeconomic perspective as well. Like think of it if you're going to scale a company too, right? I mean, we have it right now in our company where we want to ramp up our engineering team. And our CEO is saying, okay, like let's double them in a year. And I'm saying, well, it's a little bit difficult for us to do that because there's infrastructures that are going to break into that chain. And so you have to scale as fast as you can without breaking those infrastructures. Um, so mass immigration as well would just fundamentally tear a couple of the underlying in infrastructures that the culture has set up if done too quickly, right? I think let's uh let, let's go let's get dicey with this. Let's go to this comment. Sorry, dudes. It looks like your right wing Americans are already persecuting gays from New Zealand. It's horrifying. You know, it's interesting this type of comment because I, I wonder like what is the response then to what they're doing with Sharia law in fucking Afghanistan being gay? Well, well, well first America? of all, well, first of all, even among the most hardcore right wing people here in the US, being gay is a lot more accepted than people think. Peter I Thiel. think what it is is when it's overtly like sexualizing children is where yes. a lot of people take a stand, Correct. right? And some of those things are okay to take a stand against. Like, dude, there's a certain level of, of decency that you have to apply. Even among gay people, there is a crowd that's saying, look, we don't identify with these people trying to sexualize children. At that point, you're a fucking pedophile, all right? I agree. So, so even among the groups, they're like that. Now, I get that some people outside of our country want to look from the outside and judge us. Be like, well, you have this one group that hates gay people. Bro, I'm sure that there's a bunch of people in New Zealand that fucking hate everyone too, okay? You don't get to the point where it's like, hey, one day you just wake up and racism is completely gone. Homophobia is completely gone. Transphobia is completely gone. That's not how, how countries work. That's not how societies work. It's something that gradually over time people evolve. People evolve their ideas and thoughts. Even if you go back 30 years, you had Joe Biden saying, hey, I think marriage should be between a man and a woman. 30 years later, everyone changed their mind saying, you know what? Who cares if gay people get married? It's a lot more acceptable now. The by the way, is, by the way, you want to know when yeah. gay marriage was legalized in New Zealand? The, so that's such a progressive state. Twitter country. 2013. When? In America, it was yeah. 2015. So it's not like they've been doing this since the 90s. They had to figure this shit yeah. out as well. And, yep. you know, it, it takes time for every nation, but it's better than fucking being stoned to death in, in, in Iran because yeah. you're gay. Right. Yeah. And there are countries in this world right now that it's actually illegal to be gay, you know, which, Kenya. which is Kenya. like, you can't be fucking gay in Kenya. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, no, I think it's a big deal. I think that then, I, I, go ahead, go yeah. ahead. Chris. No, I'm saying it's like, I think what it is, is no one, no one has the right to say we're better than you because we did something progressive sooner than you did or later than you did. Look, we're a country of 300 million people. OK, we're not some island in the far off Pacific like that's able to like agree on something so quickly. Try to get 300 million people to agree on something, majority of them to agree on something. It's not fucking easy. But yet the U.S. is the country that's able to do it, you know. No, I agree. I think as I've gotten older, I've started, you know, when I was in, I think I've said this many times publicly in 2015, I was ready to vote for Bernie Sanders. Right. And I was like all in on that. And you get older and you're just like, man, this is like, this is not this idea of collective control over determining the power of the individual. It's not the right ideology. It is like, a, it is a bad totalitarian way of thinking of the world. We should value the individual. So the Supreme Court decision about the wedding designer who uh, the Supreme Court ruled six, three, that can't, that doesn't want to help gay people or design for gay people. Same thing with like the cake and gay people a couple of years ago. One can look at that and be like, that's persecution against gay people. Another perspective is like, well, wait a second. That person has a unique religious freedom that the Supreme Court is recognizing that they are valuing over this type of uh, 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 you have to serve th these people right over the collective. And then there's other wedding designers that will happily work for you if you're gay, if you don't like that person. Right. But why force that? So there's just such a nuance. To it, but the fact is, in America, we can have that debate. And I think that's what's the most important thing. And, and it cuts both ways. Like, what if you're a tailor and someone comes to you and says, hey, I want you to draw up a Nazi uniform for me. Are you able to say yes or no? Like, no, I can't, you, I can't do that. Oh, well, you're, you're impinging on my, on my freedom. Like, you're discriminating against me for being a Nazi. Yes. Or you're a, or you're a gay you. Nazi. Let's make it even more complicated. Whatever, dude. It's right? just, <laughs> really it's complicated. Just, there's, there's a lot more nuance to these things than we'd like to believe. But at the end of the day, 
we're a country of freedom. We're a country of opportunity. We're a country of equality. And that's what makes America great. So Tanner, go ahead. You're going to say something. No, I, I wasn't going to say anything. I, I find it, uh, I always find politics to be a really touchy subject. Yeah, we got to get some of your, bro, Tanner, you got 10,000 subscribers now. You're growing. We got to get the real Tanner. We got Tanner, are you a Republican or a Democrat? Time to get you canceled, Tanner. Get I, you canceled, baby. Uh, I definitely <laughs> lean Republican for sure, just because I'm, a, I, I think everyone that runs a stock channel or some sort of finance channel at some point has to lean Republican. Why? Why? Can, can we bring that up for discussion? Taxes. Why? are stock people because i because i noticed this when i got into youtube 2021 i started realizing as you know you're interacting you're like damn everyone's a fucking republican like why is everyone a republican if you're in the well, stocks investing when you're gonna get older you'll understand yeah it's in, uh, it's just uh, i think taxes people want like as 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 people stay young they want everyone to have the same thing as people get older they don't want their thing to supply it for others they want to have their thing <laughs> you know what i mean they they worked hard for it they want to keep it i think that's you know, a pretty fair thing to want. <laughs> <laughs> bro, I know um, the real shit. I, bro, in 2015, if you said you were Republican, I literally thought you were racist. Like, my life has changed so much since then. Now I'm just like, yes. oh, I'm Republican. Welcome to like the red. Welcome well, to the red pill. It's not, it's not even a one to one thing. In 2015, the left didn't mean what it means today. Like, it just yeah, completely well, skewed true. the other way. But also, I think that people, like, if you, if, if people hear what I have to say that uh, about taxes or, 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 you know, me wanting a capitalist structure, then they think that, you know, you guys know what my opinions are on gun rights and abortion and all these things. It's like, that's not me. I'm a, I'll, I'll pick and choose what I like and what I don't. And I just think that it's so weird dividing an entire country of 300 plus million people into two different groups, uh, which I, I do actually find is much better in Canada. There's, a, you know, many different parties. Uh, which is which is better? Hard disagree. Um, hard hard disagree on that, because you have three main. Okay, so you have like five parties, but then you have like the Green Party and like the super radical party, and then like nobody votes for. And then so you have the the Red Party, the Blue Party, and like the in between party. And what happens is coalitions form. So let's say Blues win the majority of the actual like aggregate vote, and then a coalition forms between the two, like the second place and the third place, and then they form a majority in in like the house well what the fuck's the point of voting at that point yeah I, I, so like i don't the, know i think it, the it, third it, the third place is always a swing for whoever's the second place to gain the majority is my is my point which is it makes it kind of cheapens it yeah but i also think that people like i find people get mad whenever they were the minority vote but then you're the minority of the country like your votes do not represent the votes of the country so mm -hmm. Well, Chris says no, but if the majority of the country wants to go that way, then you're saying that those people have a less opinion than you. When your opinion it is weighted equally amongst everyone else. That's why it's not based on net worth or anything. Your vote is a vote. 